God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, heading up the Bravehearted Men's Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Last year, I told the detailed story of the Mayflower just before our Thanksgiving celebration here. This year, I share how God is in the mix. So today's agenda is the journey with God in the center. Number two, the Mayflower Compact. Number three, U.S. Presidents and Thanksgiving. Number four, what God says about Thanksgiving. Number five, biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Number six, Thanksgiving understood in the Bible. Number seven, what U.S. citizens are thankful for. Number eight, being thankful during the historic pandemic that we're all in now. And number nine, what the Resurrection Center is thankful for. The famous Mayflower story began in the year 1606 when a group of reform-minded Puritans in Nottinghamshire, England, founded their own church separate from the state-sanctioned Church of England. Accused of treason, they were forced to leave the country and settle in the more tolerant Netherlands. After 12 years of struggle to adapt and make a decent living, the group sought financial backing from some London merchants to set up a colony in the New World, and these are the colonies across the Atlantic in what is present-day America. The pilgrims were separatist Protestants who made a clean break with the Church of England during the reign of King James. They believed in strict adherence to the world of Jesus Christ. Led by their pastor, John Robinson, they first moved in 1609 to Leiden, Holland, but after 11 years, they wanted a place of their own. Their children were losing their identity in this new place. They moved back to England to prepare for the move to the New World across the Atlantic. On September 6, 1620, 102 passengers crowded on the Mayflower to begin the long, hard journey to a new life in the New World. The Mayflower was one of two ships, but the other had a leak and return. Passengers on both ships were now on just the Mayflower, crowded. On November 9, 1620, the Mayflower, carrying 102 passengers with 50 pilgrims aboard in search of religious freedom, approached Cape Cod, Massachusetts, having left England 65 days earlier uh, on September 6, 1620. On November 11, 1620, the Mayflower anchored. That was 400 years ago. A week ago was the anniversary. That date was also a Wednesday. The ship was lost through a storm originally heading to Jamestown to join an existing settlement in a new colony territory. Instead, they arrived to a barren land void of crops. There was nothing there. They were called pilgrims by their journalist, William Bradford, who had in mind the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, 13 through 16, when he wrote, They knew they were the pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. They wished to live in a community life as the apostles in the New Testament of the Bible. After exploring the region, the settlers chose a cleared area previously occupied by members of a local Native American tribe called the Wampanoag. The tribe had abandoned the village several years earlier after an outbreak of a European disease. The The winter of 1620 through 1621 was brutal as the pilgrims struggled to build their settlement, uh, to find food and ward off, most importantly, sickness. By spring, 50 of the original 102 Mayflower passengers had already perished. They were dead. The remaining settlers made contact with returning members of the Wampanoag tribe, and in March, they signed a peace treaty with a tribal chief, Massasoit, You can imagine where the name Massachusetts came from. Aided by the Wampanoag, especially the English-speaking Squanto, the pilgrims were able to plant crops, especially corn and beans, that were vital to their survival. The Mayflower and its crew, the remaining crew, left Plymouth to return to England on April 5, 1621. So the ship remained only during the winter. The 102 passengers were made up of 50 saints, the pilgrims, and what was called strangers, the non-separatists, and the crew. In view of the independent spirit of some, it became evident to both saints and strangers that they needed to cooperate and sign an agreement to rule themselves, as they were going to settle in an area that was not within the purview of their patent. They were headed to Jamestown. 
The elder William Brewster, William Bradford, Edward Winslow, and the Pilgrims, along with soldier Miles Standish and the Strangers, these are the non-Pilgrims, agreed to sign a covenant before they landed to ensure rep representative self-government by which all of them would be bound. Signed by the 41 adult males aboard on November 11, 1620, just nine years after the publication of the King James Bible, the Mayflower Compact was the first charter of freedom in America and reflects the Christian heritage of our nation. And here's the Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, that's how it starts, in the name of God, amen, period. That's the first sentence. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of England, France, and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equate equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign lord, King James of England, France of and Ireland, the 18th and and of the Scotland, the uh, 54th. So, that's the compact. So, And you can see how God was in center of their laws. In keeping with the compact, the pilgrims confirmed John Carver, the first elected governor in the English colonies. The pilgrims landed at Provincetown, Cape Cod, on November 11, 1620. Since the next day was Sunday, they stayed aboard the ship and worshipped God under the guidance of Elder Brewster. After crossing Cape Cod Bay, they found Plymouth Rock and decided this was the ideal spot to build a settlement. Because of stormy weather, it was not until December 23 that they were able to land and begin setting up home. They were on land on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. Half of the colonists did not survive that first winter, including their first governor, John Carver. William Bradford was elected governor in the spring of 1621. The Pilgrims made a treaty with Massasoit, an alliance between the godly William Bradford and Massasoit, an alliance that would last as long as both were alive. That spring, the Indians, Samoset, and Squanto showed the Pilgrims how to cultivate the land and plant corn, beans, squash, and pumpkins, and where to hunt and fish. The image, the popular photo, well, not photo, drawing or painting, uh, that image of the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth in 1621, with the Pilgrims in Massasoit and the Wampanoag Indians, is forever etched upon the American conscience. The celebration lasted for three days. Here's how settler Edward Winslow described their thankful hearts. And although it is not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Over the next several decades, more and more settlers made the trek across the Atlantic to Plymouth, which gradually grew into a prosperous shipbuilding and fishing center. In 1691, Plymouth was incorporated into the new Massachusetts Bay Association, ending its history as an independent colony. Now let's talk about U.S. presidents in Thanksgiving. Let's first talk about George Washington. Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first president to declare a national day of Thanksgiving for the people of the United States. In the year 1789, George Washington proclaimed a day of public thanksgiving and thanks to thank God for his protection and as the source of all that is good. In his proclamation, he wrote, Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being, who is the benefit, who is the benefit uh, author of all good that was, that is, or that will be, that they may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation. And you notice that uh, the 26th of November that uh, George Washington had declared, it's the same day as this year, uh, in the year 2020. 
Um, let's talk about Abraham Lincoln. On October 3, in the year 1863, expressing gratitude for a pivotal uni Union Army victory at Gettysburg, President Abraham Lincoln announces that the nation will celebrate an official Thanksgiving holiday on November 26, 1863. So that's when November 26, not a Thursday, but November 26, became the official Thanksgiving holiday. Um, later on November uh, 19th, at the dedication of a military cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln delivered one of the most memorable speeches in American history. That's the Gettysburg Address. So it's the same year that that happened. Let's talk about uh, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR. Franklin Roosevelt observed Thanksgiving on the second to last Thursday of November for some time, but the amount of public outrage prompted Congress to pass a law on December 26, 1941, ensuring that all Americans would celebrate a unified Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday of November of every year. That's when it became stuck as a Thursday. The House agreed to the amendment, and President Roosevelt signed the resolution on December 26, 1941, thus establishing the fourth Thursday in November as the federal Thanksgiving holiday that we know today. Now, let's talk about John F. Kennedy, shortly before he was assassinated. Uh, by President John F. Kennedy presidential proclamation on November 4, 1963, he was assassinated in 18 uh, days later on the 22nd. So I read just some excerpts. Over three centuries ago, our forefathers in Virginia and in Massachusetts, far from home in a lonely wilderness, set aside a time of Thanksgiving. On the appointed day, they gave reverent thanks for their safety, for their health of their children, for their fertility of their fields, for the love which bound them together, and for the faith which united them with their God. And so too, in the midst of America's tragic civil war, President Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday of November, 1863, as a day to renew our gratitude for America's fruitful fields, for our national strength and vigor, and for all our singular deliverances and blessings. Now, therefore, I, John F. Kennedy, President of the United States of America, in consequence with the joint resolution of the Congress approved December 26, 1941, um, uh, uh, 55, Statute 862, designating the fourth Thursday of November in each year as Thanksgiving Day, do hereby proclaim Thursday, November 28, 1963, as a day of national Thanksgiving. So that's what the United States presidents had said about Thanksgiving. Now, more importantly, what does God say about Thanksgiving? Let's find out. The concept of thanks comes up 102 times in the Old Testament, and this word is used 72 of those times. In First Chronicles 16.34, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Again, that's in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. Thanksgiving can strengthen your faith, Thanking and praising God gives a person immense strength they could never dream of. By reminiscing about everything the Lord has done for you, your faith grows more and more each time you give thanks. That's why we do that. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6-7, through seven, the scripture reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ." Jesus. People who are thankful to God are thankful for those who care for them as well as God's blessings to them. Thankful people are content with how God has dealt with them. Now, I'll make note that in Psalms 106, 107, 118, and 136 all begin with these words, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for a steadfast love endures forever. Okay? Jesus taught us to be thankful and to be in fellowship. Science proves it. Can you believe that? Science proves it. Research by U.S. psychologists indicate that gratitude can also lead to better relationships. It makes sense. We should be thankful because it honors God when we are thankful. We recognize that God exists and we are acting on the reality of his life as the very source and means of ours. True thankfulness recognizes our total dependence on God and stems from realizing that everything going on in our lives and we all have is a product of God's sovereign control, infinite wisdom, purposes, grace, and activity. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Now, here are three biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Number one, 
Thanksgiving relates to the Trinity. Did you know that? The typical pattern of Thanksgiving in the New Testament is that the God the Father is the object of Thanksgiving. God the Son is the person through whom Thanksgiving flows, and God the Holy Spirit is the source of Thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul models this in Romans chapter 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Now let's go to number two. Thanksgiving replaces sin. When the Apostle Paul commands believers to stop sinning, he also commands believers to put thanksgiving in its place. The Apostle Paul writes, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And that's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. And number three, thanksgiving in all circumstances. One surprising aspect of thanksgiving is that it's all for all circumstances, not just for one big meal a year. The Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Uh, now I'll talk about Thanksgiving as it's understood in the Bible. With promises of really great deals on Black Friday littered between college football timeouts, the meaning of Thanksgiving sometimes gets missed. We pause to give thanks for the food, family members, and friends gathered around the table in the midst of preparing elaborate meals and navigating family relations. But giving thanks isn't a practice reserved for a single day each year. It has a deeper spiritual significance and benefits that ring true long after the leftovers are consumed. In times of uncertainty, it may seem strange to turn to gratitude, but think of it. When else do we need to rel rely on God most except when we're faced with the unknown? You can be thankful even in times of fear, sadness, and grief. Gratitude draws our eyes away from the pain, terror, and anxiety of loss and helps us focus on the gifts of this world, moving us forward along with the healing process. There are also times when life just doesn't seem like a season for gratitude. Maybe you have a chronic illness. Maybe you're caring for an elderly parent or a special needs child. Thankfulness for these circumstances, even when each day brings fresh challenges, helps us to find hope and meaning. We can be thankful that God guides us through these times. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Pers uh, character and uh, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Gratitude collectively as a family or community is a tremendous equalizer. When differences of political and religious or cultural opinion and stance are present, gratitude helps us to focus on the areas of our relationships that matter the most. It's hard to be grateful for each other and still wield our theological, political, and cultural weapons. At the start of the letters from which Apostle Paul sent throughout the first century following Jesus' Jesus's resurrection, uh, the Apostle Paul expresses his thanks for the people. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. He writes to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, I thank my God every time I remember you. He tells the church in Philippi in Philippians 1, verse 3, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. There's something about expressing your gratitude for a person, not just saying that you, when you they do something, but uh, thank you for just being said. That forms a bond of trust in uh, your relationship. It acknowledges a particular characteristic about a person that raises their esteem in a way the Apostle Paul says we ought to encourage one another or build one another up. Gratitude for another person may be one of the most impactful and practical ways we can build up one another. The traditions we act with friends and family are perhaps one of the most obvious forms of thanksgiving. Traditions performed together spotlight seasons of our lives in which we've seen God active and present in our lives. They hold the record of years past when the children were younger, 
when we are all together and when great grandpa was alive and so on. They provide opportunities to reminisce. So here's what U.S. citizens are thankful for. Um, number one, religious freedom, freedom from persecution. Number two, access to clean water, safe food, and quality medicine. Number three, education for us and our children. Number four, safety from war on domestic lands. Number five, freedom of speech. Um, my wife is, able, is free to speak to me in a Spanish, and I may not understand it, but uh, except to look. <laughs> Number six, the American dream, education, job, marriage, home. Number seven, the beauty of America, it's not being bombed out. Number eight, culture, the blend is just right. The right to vote by mail, drive in, and at the polls. A church family with God in the center. So that's what we're thankful for, and the list goes on. We can also be thankful during the historic pandemic. Uh, we can order restaurant food, groceries, and supplies. Some people are doing more with cooking at home. Number two, jobs such as gig workers from Uber, Flex Delivery, Instacart. Um, uh, I hire 45 crowdsourced staff around the world, and we're hiring another 45. Number three, education continues. It's online. Um, I just recently completed a graduate certificate uh, at Harvard University. So I'm doing the online thing as well. Number four, streaming movies and music for entertainment along with games. We're doing our next uh, TV series. Uh, we did Inspire. We did Morning Coffee. Now we're doing Viewpoint. Number five, uh, the Bible never left you. It's still there. This year, the people at the Resurrection Center, specifically the Resurrection Center, from what I've seen, have a lot to be thankful for. Number one, they had a birthday this year. Number two, some have moved to a new home. Number three, some have got new cars. There's a couple of families I know that got two new cars. Uh, number four, they got married or perhaps a new love in their life. Number five, they have healthy babies or new ones on the way. Number six, uh, they saved their jobs or their businesses. Number seven, they went to college to broaden their horizons. Number eight, they have family who survived adversities. Uh, number nine, they went on vacation or went on local travel. Number 10, they have clothes to wear and food to eat. Number 11, they continue to love from, uh, they have continued love from uh, their church, the Resurrection Center. Number 12, they know that someone prays for them. Number 13, they aren't alone. We have friends and family, and more importantly, the church family. See, Thanksgiving is a time for food, friends, and family. It's also a time to pause, reflect on our lives, and think about what we're thankful for. Rejoice in the presence of the Lord for what he has given you. Do not focus on what you don't have, but to focus on what you do have. What will you be thankful for this Christmas? Uh, I should say Thanksgiving Day. Our agenda today was, number one, the journey with God in the center. Number two, the Mayflower Compact. Number three, the U.S. Presidents and Thanksgiving. Number four, what God says about Thanksgiving. Number five, biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Number six, Thanksgiving understood in the Bible. Number seven, what U.S. citizens are thankful for. Number eight, being thankful during historic pandemic. And number nine, what the Resurrection Center is thankful for. So again, what will you be thankful for this Thanksgiving Day? My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.